uh, we're starting Genesis, and we're going to hit just really the first couple of verses here, but just try to give you all of the uh, background uh, information, and uh, hopefully uh, it'll be uh, helpful to you. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless our time in your word as we just uh, sometimes uh, need, need your spirit to help us uh, focus, listen, Lord, and so many of these things we're talking about can come across as academic, and yet we've, there's a lost and dying world that uh, does not believe in the opening verses of, of Genesis, Lord. So we pray that uh, we could just glean uh, what we could, that it might be something we could share with others here in the coming days and weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. When you try to uh, share or witness sometimes with people these days, it's uh, our tendency maybe at some point in time in the past was to tell them about Jesus, tell them about the death and the resurrection if they were a skeptic or didn't believe or weren't familiar with things. But you can't really start there today. Uh, people, you actually need to start with, uh, did the universe have a beginning? I mean, you've, you've got to make a case for creation and for the creator to establish the existence of God before you even get to his sending his son to die for the, uh, die for the sins of the world. So this becomes, Genesis becomes, of course, a book that because of that, and it's so foundational, it's under attack all the time, but it becomes uh, something practical that we kind of need to, uh, to, to understand. I remember uh, showing up uh, at a family party uh, a few years ago, and one of, uh, one of Kathy's aunties comes over and says, you got to... Uh, you got to talk to my niece. She's, <laughs> she's living in Berserkley. I think it's called Berkeley, though. And, uh, <laughs> and she's studying with some, you know, 14-year-old kid who's a, a god from India. And uh, she's really taken in by this guy. So could you talk to her? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So I kind of <clears throat> made my way and sat down. I just um, hadn't seen her in a long time. Okay, figure out, okay, you're and the mother and you're related here. And that's because, and okay, we got all that... Uh, uh, figured out who belongs to who and how we're all connected. And, and then I said, hey, your, uh, your auntie says you're, you're studying with, uh, uh, you're interested in religion. You're studying with a guy from India. I've been to India a couple of times. Oh, really? You know, and then we kind of go through the whole thing and, and we get around to finding the guy's name and a few other details and stuff. And then I, I said, could I just ask you a, a couple of questions that might help you in your study of religion and, you know, world religion? So, Sure, I said, do you believe that the universe had a beginning? Well, I don't know, I've never really thought about it or not. I said, you know, because science, a long time ago, you know, the whole Carl Sagan cosmos, the universe is all there was, all there is, and all there ever will be. Now, I'm gonna read you a, a quote from scientists today that, that totally uh, debunks that because of the Hubble telescope and uh, in the Doppler technology, we know the universe is completely expanding. And I, I mentioned that to her uh, I also mentioned the fact that, you know, the uh, second law of thermodynamics tells us that, that everything is, is, is winding down. If we look at the sun, you know, it's burning, it's letting off energy, it's getting less and less, it's not creating energy, and that most scientists today say the universe had a beginning. And then I gave her uh, an argument for, uh, from philosophy uh, that just says, could, a, could, a, could you crawl out of a bottomless pit? And the answer to that is no, because there's no beginning to it, so you could never make any progress at it. At the same time, if, if, uh, if the universe has always existed infinitely that way, as well as that way, then we could never arrive at now. There could be no time if there wasn't a beginning. And uh, that, that takes a second cup of coffee to kind of get that. But uh, I, first time I heard that was from... Uh, on a Monday morning in a class, and I didn't really get that till about 11.30, I had to kind of keep, I'm not sure if I heard the rest of Dr. Moreland's uh, uh, lecture that morning, but it finally did uh, uh, sink in. So I finally, and she agreed, we talked a little more, that the universe did have a beginning. I said, if it had a beginning, then it had to have a first cause. And uh, we would say that first cause is God. It had to be somebody powerful enough to create life, create universe, so on and so forth. And, uh, and she pretty much agreed uh, with that. And I, then I could just simply turn it around. I go, now, this young guy that you're studying with, does he claim to be God or a God? Yes, he does. Now, do you think he's the creator of the universe? No. 
then should you be following him and worshiping him? In fact, is he telling you a lie by saying that he's God? Uh, this was an easy one, and she said, uh, yeah. And, uh, and I didn't, you know, she didn't get on her knees and accept the Lord right then or anything, but she did agree that it would be futile to continue to study with a 14-year-old kid that thinks he's God. Now, I know that's not a stretch for any of us to figure that out, but it was a, it was a revelation from her. And I've used those same arguments in, in sharing with people from uh, Buddhist faith as well as another, uh, a number of other world religions uh, and views that are out there. So this becomes very pertinent in terms of our sharing with other people. Did the universe have a beginning? Uh, yes, it did. And the Bible begins by saying, in the beginning, God created. And in terms of people accepting the rest of the Bible, the things that happened in the Bible in terms of miracles, if you can grasp that God spoke the universe into existence, everything else is pretty downhill from there in terms of uh, a measure of faith. So let's look at uh, the overview of Genesis. First, the, the name of the book, it's, uh, uh, the Hebrew name is actually uh, Bereshit, which means in the beginning. Uh, we refer to it as Genesis, which is a Greek name. So how do we get calling the first book of the Hebrew Bible by a Greek name? Well, it comes along in about 250 B.C., when uh, Jewish scholars are putting together uh, the Old Testament into Greek so more people could read it and understand it. And, uh, and therefore, that's where we get the name uh, Genesis, the uh, kind of, in a sense, a transliteration of the, of the Greek word. It's important because of the doctrines that it teaches and informs us about God, man, uh, creation. Keep in mind that Moses is a writing at a time when they've come out of the, uh, the Egyptian captivity uh, where you had... Uh, a very pluralistic society in terms of everybody was polytheistic. Think about the plagues that God brought about. They worshiped the Nile, so he turns the Nile into blood. Uh, uh, the things that they worshiped is the things that God kind of, in a sense, turned on its head uh, and showed them the futility by bringing the plagues uh, upon them. Uh, that's the, the background of what the people had been exposed to, and, and he's writing in uh, in the midst of that, to make sure that people understood and knew that God is one and that he is the creator. Now, missionologists and others will tell us today that 90% of what we call folk religion, those are religions of people around the world that organized religion have never gotten to. Uh, so uh, no, nobody's made it there yet. But as they do, in 90% of the time, like the Hawaiians here in the Hawaiian Islands, all believe that there was one God and that he was the creator of God. And of course, what brought about the, the revival here uh, among the islands, uh, leading to Hawaii becoming a Christian nation uh, and sending out missionaries all over the South Pacific, uh, was the fact that the king and the queen met with the high priest at a point in time and decided that our religion has been corrupted, basically from a high priest from Tahiti, who's determined that there was many gods and, and brought what we know as uh, the Hawaiian religion or, or idolatry here. They said, our forefathers believed there was one God. He was a creator God. He was a God of love. We need to pray to him that he would bring someone to us to tell us how we can know him, how he could worship him, and, uh, and so forth. So you have the Aloha Keaku, the God of love. Missionaries show up from New England, say, we're here to tell you about the one true God who's the creator of God, who loves you and how you can know him through his son, Jesus Christ. They readily accept the gospel. Revival spreads throughout the Hawaiian Islands. There's a, another group of people like that in northern Burma. Here's, here's uh, Adoram Judson, the first American missionary, uh, laboring away through, through the loss of children, loss of wives due to plagues and different diseases and so forth, sick off and on most of his life, laboring away, translating the scriptures into that language of that part of the world, uh, not always seeing a lot of success, very little like he came in su successive generations. Little did he know if he could have just made it up the river, 40 or 50 miles, there was a group of indigenous people there that believed there was one true God who was the creator God. Uh, and they believed in a story of the fall or sin coming, similar to the Adam and Eve story, as well as the flood story, which most of these groups do. Uh, and once missionaries reached them, they also readily accepted the gospel, although they had been being persecuted for the little bit of faith they had by Buddhists for a thousand years. But for a thousand years, they refused uh, to go the way of Buddhism because they knew that that was a false religion 
based on what they knew going all the way back to their forefathers. So uh, very important, Genesis, the creation account uh, is really a story about God. It's also the story about man. Uh, as one writer says, where we see that man is both wonderful and awful uh, all at the same time. And we'll see that uh, in the stories and the narratives uh, in the text. And of course, in the doctrine of salvation, because we've got the fall of man in Genesis 3, and then, of course, the promise of the Messiah there in 316. All of these things shape our worldview, how we think about things. Uh, the uh, many in the scientific community, academic world, say we believe we live in a closed system. Uh, what you see is what you get. There's nothing outside of it. Uh, there's nothing outside the time-space continuum. We believe there is something outside there, that uh, there is God. He is the first cause. He is the, the creator. Uh, and it makes a difference in how we see things. Our founding fathers, for example, believed uh, in the Genesis account uh, in the sinfulness of man's heart. Therefore, when they established our government as Bible-believing, born-again, evangelical Christians, uh, many of them pastors, when they write it, they write it in such a way as there's checks and balances. There's a presidency, there's a judicial, and then there's the congressional. Because those three need to keep an eye on each other because of the sinfulness of man's heart and his tendency to do evil. That's why they came up with that system of government. If we throw out this idea of the sinfulness of man, uh, we lead to uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, helpful things that try to help people, but uh, are not really too helpful. Modern psychology is based on the fact that man is basically neutral. You know, and if you give him the right education and the right opportunities and the right whatever, he's going to be fine. Liberal th theologians believe the same way. They believe in sin, but they believe in community sin or, uh, or sin is in terms of uh, 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 a whole group of people. And we get rid of sin, again, by fighting poverty and so forth. And those are all very good things, but it's never going to change the heart of man. And, uh, and if we miss this foundational teaching about the doctrine of salvation in Genesis, we'll have a lot of problems in terms of our theology. Well, it's not just theology, of course. It's the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the way to Joseph and Egypt as we, uh, as we get to those portions of the book and their lives and uh, God working in and through their lives. In terms of the overview, it's uh, uh, basically constructed from uh, chapters 1 to 11, the fall, <laughs> excuse me, creation, fall, and the flood and um, the history of the beginning of planet Earth, and then from chapter 12, we're introduced to Abraham, all the way to chapter 50, where we've got uh, uh, Joseph in the end uh, in Egypt, the story of the patriarch. So that's how it's, uh, and that'll probably be on the final. 1 to 11 is the uh, uh, primeval history of the planet. 12 to, uh, to 50 is the patriarchal story. So, uh, but these themes are uh, divided up, very interesting by a, a Hebrew word uh, uh, that is uh, teledoth. It means the generations of. It, that phrase, the generation of, occurs 10 times in Genesis, five in the first uh, half of the book, five in the second half of the book. Again, uh, no, no accidents here. There's uh, some very interesting literary structure that Moses uses uh, in putting the, this book together. Uh, and the stories, of course, are each in a certain sequence. Uh, they, they talk about um, sin as it is described. Uh, a speech is then given. Grace is applied. And then punishment is given. So there's five stories. There's a break. Book changes. And then there's five more stories. Let me give you an example. In the opening story, you've got uh, Adam and Eve and the fall. Uh, and, uh, in chapter 3, verse 6, if you want to read there, I'll read... A few, more than a few verses from chapter 3. But here's the sin. The sin is given. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that a tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So there's sin happens. Sin is described. That's going to be part of the pattern. And then the speech. There's a speech by God announcing the penalty in verses 14 and 19. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. 
uh, so on and so forth. And then verse 16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow uh, and, uh, and your conception in pain you shall break forth, forth, uh, forth children. Uh, your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. Verse 17, and then to Adam and so forth. So the speech, uh, sin comes, there's a speech uh, by, by God, uh, and then there's grace. And we see that uh, in verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Again, this is going to be the pattern throughout all of these stories in all of these narratives. We're going to see the sin, we're going to see the speech, and then we're going to see grace. And then lastly, the punishment. God punishes sin. Uh, and that's in verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden and so forth. So the punishment is given for Adam and Eve. So that's the, the structure that, uh, that Moses uses. It's broken in two halves, five different narratives, and that pattern is going to follow in, in each one of them. I don't know if you enjoyed that, but that just totally blessed me. I thought that was just totally interesting. It's like, wow, wow. <laughs> well, let's look at the content of the book. Content includes grace, and we might say his amazing grace. One of the things you hear sometimes of people that don't read the Bible very much or haven't studied it very much is they say, I like reading from the New Testament because there's where we find that God is a God of love and a God of grace. I don't like reading from the Old Testament because that's where you find out that God is judge, judgeful and vengeful and so forth. And you've got Jesus, meek and mild, the God of the New Testament, and you've got a, a, a big angry guy with a long beard and so forth that's the God of the Old Testament somehow uh, in people's minds. And of course, in saying that, they're pretty much telling you, I've never actually read the New Testament, nor have I actually read the, uh, the Old Testament, but it's just kind of a theory that I have. Uh, because uh, as, you, uh, as you know, by the time you get to that last book of the New Testament, Revelation, I'm pretty sure there's a couple little judgments in there. I'm just pretty sure. Uh, and of course, what we're going to see uh, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament, as we've seen in any of the books that we've studied, uh, the theme here really is, is God's grace in working with, uh, with people. And one of the things that we're going to see is that uh, as these stories progress, from Adam and Eve to Cain and Abel, uh, is you're going to see an avalanche of sin. It's going to get worse and worse. They eat of the tree. Cain kills his brother. It's, it's an avalanche of sin that gets worse and worse. But at the same time, so does God's grace. Therefore, what Paul says in, uh, in Romans 6 totally applies where, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And we could say that's the theme of Genesis. Where sin abounds, grace abounds uh, all the more. And, uh, and that continues. Now, <clears throat> when Adam and Eve are punished, God graciously withholds the death penalty. They begin to die. They no longer can eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of, uh, of, or the tree of life. They're banished from the garden and they begin to die, uh, but they don't die immediately. And God makes a covering for them to cover their sins. Cain is banished from his family because of the murder of Abel, and God does what? He puts a mark of protection upon him. Uh, the flood comes. Uh, that's God's judgment again because of sin, but God graciously saves Noah and his family. And it's only in the case of the Tower of Babel that the element of grace is not missing, but it's muted because that throws this into the great stories of grace in terms of the patriarchs. We've got Abraham, and we think of Abraham in Genesis 22, where he is there, and he has such faith in God that he's willing to take his son, his young adult son, Isaac, up to Mount Moriah, the same mountain that Jesus would die for our sins one day. He takes him up there, believing, the writer of Hebrews says, that even if he sacrifices him, even if he makes him a burnt sacrifice, he believes because he's the promised one the Messiah will come through, God will raise him again right out of the ashes. And we go, wow, that's, that's pretty awesome faith. But at the same time, Abraham doesn't start out that way. He starts out getting a call from God in Genesis 12 and kind of obeying. <laughs> 
<laughs> leave your family. Oh, I kind of forgot that one. Go to the land, I'll show you. I went part way. You know, I mean, he's this partial obedience. Of course, he finally makes it into the land uh, that God would give uh, uh, his uh, children, his physical descendants, uh, as we know as Israel. And of course, the first time there's a drought, he bails on God. I can't trust God. I'm going to Egypt. Uh, they've got water. They irrigate. So they're kind of the breadbasket of the ancient world. And by the way, Sarah, when we get there, tell them you're my sister. You know, and, and we have this line and so forth. God judges and then spares them. Never does that again, right? No, it does it again the, the next time. And we see the stumbling of Abraham. And of course, that continues with, with Isaac and then and then Jacob himself is, um, I mean, just his name alone. Jacob means, you know, dirty, sneaky thief. You know, that's not, that's not the greatest thing to name your kid. That's in the vernacular. He'll catch her trying to usurp authority. So, uh, and, and it takes a long time. The trickster of trickster, the ultimate con man, Jacob. And he finally meets his match in his, his, uh, his father-in-law. God graciously deals with the patriarchs. But by the time we're done, when we say, that we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you should giggle a little bit when you think about these characters and think, man, God, you are so gracious the way you kept working with these guys. And uh, again, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So the contents includes this wonderful doctrine of grace and then also faithfulness. The record recounts God's faithfulness over and over in the lives of the patriarchs. And, uh, and when God promises something, they come to believe that it will happen. 2 Timothy 2.13 in the New Testament says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself a primary reality about God, that he is faithful, he's faithful to his word. Now, the third thing about the content, it includes salvation through faith. That's not something that is a New Testament doctrine that is something there all along. And every time Paul wants to teach about salvation through faith, he quotes Genesis 15, 6 of Abraham. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. It's before the Mosaic law, before Moses ever comes along. If someone was going to have a right relationship with God, it was going to be because of their faith and their trust in God. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Uh, later, Paul would say this about Abraham in Romans 4.11. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. Abraham believed God. It was counted or reckoned on his behalf that he would have a right standing before God. And therefore, it would be for everyone, Jew and Gentile, no matter what your background, religious, not religious, whatever it might be. If you place your faith in God, now for us in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross on behalf of our sins, then we have a right standing before God. We're declared righteous. We're saved through faith, uh, not works. It's not of ourselves. Paul says uh, to Titus that he saved us not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. That's something we need to, to, to believe and, and grasp. Otherwise, we're going to live in existence in our relationship with God with what we call yo-yo Christianity. You know, I'm up and I'm down. I'm up and I'm down. I used to uh, <coughs> get letters from my grandmothers who uh, <laughs> both, both held the view that you could lose your salvation. And, uh, and so they would always, at the end of the letter, would say, uh, stay prayed up because Jesus could come at any time, which meant that if I happened to walk off uh, and stump my toe on the curb that morning and curse and the rapture happened, I'd be left behind because after all, my relationship with the Lord was predicated upon my good works and, uh, and what I was doing for the Lord lately. But that's contrary to what we see in the Old Testament, that it's salvation through faith. And that's why when Paul teaches it in the New He's able to draw these illustrations from the life of Abraham. How are we doing? No, nobody's nodding out or anything yet. This is good. You guys are doing way better than the first service. I'm, I'm trying to pick it up, you know, and be a little more animated because uh, I had some folks nodding out there, you know. I think, okay, I think I heard, do I really need to know this? The author of the book, who wrote Genesis? Well, certainly we believe that Moses did. The Old and the New Testament affirm that. 
And I've given you lots of cross-references, but uh, uh, significantly, Jesus confirms Moses the writer. Jesus would say, make statements like, uh, uh, you know, and bring the offering that God requires written by Moses. He makes reference to Moses being the writer of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books, many times. Uh, John 5, 45, Jesus says, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. And here it is. For he wrote about me. Uh, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And that's just one reference. But obviously, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's <laughs> good enough for me. I always marvel at the guys that says, well, we can't always take Jesus' word. Really? You know, but anyway, I usually end the argument at that point. If they know more than Jesus, who am I to argue with them? But uh, <laughs> anyway, Jesus confirms the fact that Moses is the author. Now, there is the exception that people like to take with Deuteronomy 34, which describes the, the death uh, of Moses. You would agree that would be tough for him to have written. But uh, there's nothing out of the ordinary of, in terms of uh, ancient writings. Gleason Archer, who's a, a very fine Wonderful apologetics. Apologist says in his a survey of the Old Testament, uh, an author's final work is often published posthumously, provided he has been writing up to the time of his death. Since Joshua is recorded to have been a faithful and zealous custodian of the Torah, the first five books, Moses' literary achievement, it is quite unthinkable that he would have published it without appending such a notice as the decease of his great predecessor. Moses, uh, you know, Joshua's got the writings of Moses, uh, his, his friend, his colleague, his leader, uh, his mentor, and now Moses passes off, off the scene. It was quite a normal uh, thing for him to then write in appendix to put on, and this is how he died, and this was the last events of his life. So other than that, uh, Moses is, is the author. But uh, how did he write and describe things from the very beginning? Well, all goes back to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The writer of Hebrews in verse uh, 1 of chapter 1, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. So the writer says, how did Moses know? God spoke to him. 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God, like Moses, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In trying to describe it, Peter says, as God speaks to them and moves them so that they could then pin the words and write the things that Jesus, excuse me, that God was saying to them, and, of course, the Apostle Paul in uh, 2 Timothy uh, 3.16, all Scripture is God-breathed and therefore is profitable for and goes on. So Paul's not trying to make a statement about inspiration. He's talking of really trying to make a, a point of how we need to use the Word of God in our own lives, and it becomes the, the plumb line or the test for what is true, but at the same time gives us insight that it's like God's Spirit. Again, that word spirit is barak, and... Uh, I changed the pronunciation so I wouldn't hit anybody on the front row. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, again, the, the Spirit of God, uh, or God breathes. So God moves them along, Peter says. Paul says uh, it's God breathed as he gives them the word. This is what we refer to as the inspiration and, therefore, the inerrancy of Scripture. And uh, so Moses, no, he was not there at the beginning on uh, God's shoulder watching creation take place, but God describes it to him uh, later. In terms of the writing of the book, or in terms of the date, uh, it's late 15th century. And uh, just to read from uh, Dr. Uh, Youngblood, who is a, one of the uh, Old Testament scholars for the uh, NIV uh, Old Testament uh, study notes and so forth, helped with the translation, and uh, had a wonderful class from him. <coughs> he says... According to 1 Kings 6, when Solomon began to build the temple in the fourth year of his reign over Israel, which was the 480th year after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, the fourth year of Solomon's reign was about 996 B.C., 480 years before that would give us a date of 445, 
for the Exodus. And then you've got the 40 years of wandering and so forth. So you get late 1400s is when uh, uh, Moses pins all of this. And Dr. Youngblood talks about Moses being qualified for the task in terms of possessing the necessary education, motivation, energy, and time. He writes the Pentateuch, including the book of Genesis, late 15th century before Christ. Now remember, Moses is, is brought up in the courts of Pharaoh, uh, and he's had a tremendous uh, education. Uh, and it's probably no wonder then when we, you know, we just read the stories and go, hey, man, this is awesome. This is really cool. And we don't really think about a literary structure, <laughs> but actually it's, uh, it's actually there. Again, the one thing about inspiration uh, of the authors is God working and writing, moving through the author's own personality and so forth. And therefore, John's writings come across very differently than, than Peter's, than Paul's, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, that gets us to actually verse 1. It's a book about God and the beginning. So verse 1 of chapter 1. Uh, but again, hopefully all that's uh, helpful. I think it's always good that we do a background to know the context of what's uh, being written, why it's being written, who it's being written to. Uh, is uh, uh, Like uh, Alistair Begg uh, says, uh, uh, I have to take them to Corinth before I can take them to Cleveland. Of course, he's preaching in Cleveland. But the idea is that we need to see the writing and what it meant to its original recipients uh, if we're going to really fully understand what it should mean to us. And I, I hear it done sometimes, radio, TV, uh, and guys will read a verse and jump immediately to the application. Uh, and, uh, and when that happens, <laughs> it's like they pulled a rabbit out of their hat. You're never really sure where that thing came from. Uh, but if you can see where it's coming from, uh, then not only can you get something out of the word now, but you can do it later as you read it because you understand the terms. You understand what's being said and what these words mean and so forth, uh, and that's certainly always part of our goal. Let's look at verses, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So, First thing we know, it's, it's a book about God. Here, the, the word for God, uh, Elohim, uh, dominates the whole chapter used 35 times uh, in all. And so we'll see that throughout Genesis. What's Genesis about? Well, we could say its theme is where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. But ultimately, it's a book about God. Uh, it begins with the assumption that God exists. People in the ancient world were not atheists. That was not the issue. It was not a problem. <laughs> they believed in all kind of gods for every rock, every stone, the sun, the moon, and whatever, whatever moved or didn't move, uh, there, was, there was a god for it. Very superstitious uh, as, uh, as uh, Hindus are today, other people of certain world religions, very fearful of the so-called gods around them. We mentioned the gods of Egypt. But it begins with the assumption that you know that God exists. In the beginning, God created and uh, as Paul says in Romans 1, it should be pretty obvious to the religious person that might have the scriptures, but even to the person that uh, has never seen a Bible, doesn't know the name of Jesus, they should be able to look around. As the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And notice that there, everything is by design. It's for a reason. There are laws that govern it. Therefore, there has to be a designer or a God. Externally, he knows that. Internally, Paul says, because we all have a conscience uh, about God. We can sear that conscience, we can deny that conscience, but everybody knows it. So the Bible begins with the assumption that people know that God exists. Now there's an interesting phrase, I mentioned that Bereshith, which is the in the beginning, and then the word bara, which is created, and then Elohim. Uh, interesting phrase the Bible begins with. Elohim, again, is the plural form of God. Why not just use El? Uh, why use a plural or a compound plurality for a God? Well, us having understood the New Sabbath, we'd say because God exists in three persons. Here in Israel, the Lord thy God is one, one God, but existing in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As a New Testament believer, I would see this as a statement right at the beginning of the triunity of God. In fact, when, when God begins to create man, he then says, let us make God in our image, in our likeness, again, a plurality. Moses didn't have to write it that way. 
So how do the Jews explain that? Well, they say that uh, Moses uses that phrase to try to declare the majesty of God. It, was, it wasn't enough to declare him in a singular sense, so he has to declare it in a plural sense. Good luck with that. You know, but uh, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the explanation there. But for us, it becomes very significant, and we do see, uh, we see Jesus as well as the Holy Spirit and the Father all involved in, uh, in creation. But again, the emphasis in creation is on God. Psalm 92, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth in the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And he has always existed. So this speaks of his pre-existence to earth, what we call the time-space continuum. But he then creates out of nothing. That's the word there, bara. It means to create out of nothing. It also means to create effortlessly. Moses is very careful. He only uses this word on the occasions where it speaks of God creating. God created in the beginning. God created man. He never uses that word ever associated with man doing something, making something, or anything else. It's exclusively used of God because only God can create out of nothing. Now, the writer of Hebrews kind of helps us with this as well. Hebrews 11.3, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And again, this becomes a real problem uh, still today for the evolutionist who somehow has to try to come up with some explanation as to how all this got here. <laughs> and, uh, and the more they study and the harder they work, God bless them, they continue to establish more and more proof for what we call intelligent design that there's intelligence in everything that we see, that we study from astronomy to, uh, to the smallest uh, molecule. And, uh, and so, again, very important verse. It gives the answer to the philosophical question of materialism and naturalism, again, that says everything uh, is uh, all we see is uh, what you see is what you get. We live in a closed system, uh, and it's, uh, it's much more than that. Uh, it is interesting. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, anytime uh, a school board somewhere across the country is having a hearing on whether they should teach or allowed to be taught in their schools intelligent design along with, uh, with evolution. And it's like a riot, right? And it gets national press. And you know, we'll, we'll ruin our children. We're going to throw out the scientists. Like, this is like the, the most horrible thing that could ever, ever happen is actually teach somebody that there's a God that exists and that he, uh, he created all things. Uh, we, were, uh, we were in Hong Kong uh, just prior to the, uh, the turnover to the British in 97 and, uh, and saw the huge building uh, built on Hong Kong Island for the, uh, the actual handover ceremony. Uh, and then there with uh, some of our guys uh, and our uh, missionaries uh, a couple years later, I think two years later, and we said, okay, what's, what's changed uh, since the communists took over Hong Kong? Because, you know, you pretty much look around, everything looks pretty much the same uh, as they want it to, because they do not want to lose a huge uh, tax uh, revenue base that they have in Hong Kong, uh, the commerce that takes place and so forth. But they said there's three changes. They've limited uh, the, the right to assemble. So they issue permits for protests and parades and that kind of thing, but limit how many and how often you can get such a permit. And they've limited the uh, uh, free speech or the press. So uh, everything that goes in a newspaper that's written, of course, is censored. You can't write bad stuff against the government. You know, they're just not, it's not going to be in the paper. And uh, that would all be expected. But the third thing, the big change they made, they changed the textbooks in all the public schools and removed the teaching of intelligent design and only allow for the teaching of evolution. And they said, that's how we will capture the hearts and the minds of a generation. The transition of Hong Kong will not take place overnight. Give us 50 years, and it will be completely merged with the rest of China. Uh, very interesting. And of course, we don't have that problem in our country. You can just teach anything you want, right? No. <laughs> if you teach uh, intelligent design in this country on a professional level, uh, you're, you are banished, and uh, bad things happen to you. Uh, we read some of the examples uh, 
previous uh, uh, teachings, the, the guy that uh, ran the Smithsonian at one time just a few years ago, who is an evolutionist but allowed in one of their magazines to have an article printed by another scientist about intelligent design. What did he get for, he's not, a, he's not a intelligent design guy, he's not a Christian, but because he allowed the article to be printed, he was fired. Uh, and again, all of those things are, are documented in Ben Stein's uh, movie, uh, Expelled. But very interesting days that, uh, that we live in. A lot of this came about in the early 1990s. By 1996, Michael uh, Bay's book, Darwin's Black, book, uh, Black Box, came out. And uh, he's a biochemical uh, scientist, and, and in that book describes, as scientists have uh, done more work, to see the complexity of, uh, of each molecule and so forth, and how basically it's, uh, and I looked at some of the diagrams, it's just amazing, it really does look like little machines that are uh, operating that uh, uh, ex allow life to exist. And he says uh, in that book, uh, quote, biological systems at the molecular level have paralyzed scientists' attempt to explain their origins. It's just impossible to explain. One of the guys in the first service uh, uh, a number of years ago had taught uh, science in the public schools. <clears throat> and he said that he would teach, uh, he would teach uh, creation or intelligent design along with Darwinian uh, ev evolution. And, uh, and sooner or later, the, te the students would ask him, but Mr. So-and-so, you know, what do you believe? What do you think it's right? I go, well, you, and he would say, you have to decide for yourself. But let me put it this way. If I brought a bro bucket in here and I filled it full of sand and I shook it up real hard, uh, do you think that when I took the lid off, there would be an intricate sand castle built there? Because if you do, then you believe in Darwinian evolution. If, on the other hand, you thought somebody had to take the lid off and build the sand castle, then you believe in intelligent design. I'm not telling you what to believe. It's up to you. <laughs> but but that, that is the, the two arguments there, uh, a good way of illustrating it. Uh, William Dembski, in his introduction to Mere Creation, says, Darwin gave us a creation story, one in which God was absent and undirected natural processes did the work. That creation story has held sway for more than 100 years. It is now on its way out. Because as more science is done, uh, it just changes the, the playing field. Uh, in his uh, book, uh, Malcolm McGregoridge, The End of Christendom, says, I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially to the extent to which it has been applied, will be one of the greatest jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so very flimsy and dubious a hypothesis could be accepted, and yet that's the world that, uh, that we live in now. And please understand, we're talking about evolution uh, on a vertical plane, not a horizontal plane. Uh, yes, uh, you know, plants can alter and change and be modified based on their environment, so can animals and so forth, but you don't have dogs becoming giraffes, you don't have giraffes becoming hippotam hippopotamus, you don't have species jumping to the next species, which is what you need for Darwinian evolution to actually function uh, and, and work. Well, it's a, a book about uh, not only creation, but it's a book about the universe. In the beginning, Moses says, God created the heavens uh, and the earth. And again, using that term uh, only found here in the Bible, specifying God as the, uh, as the creator. And uh, one of the things that this has done for the Western world is at one point in time, whether you're aware of it or not, Eastern scientists and thinkers were far ahead of those of the West in the ancient world uh, up until about the 1500s and what we call the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and then there was tremendous breakthroughs in the Western world, and we had the beginnings of what we know as the scientific thought and process because those scientists believed that God was the creator, that he exists, and he created laws that then govern the universe. If he created those laws, then those laws could be discovered. And so they set out to discover those laws. That's the foundation for science that we, we know today. Sometimes Christianity is accused of being anti-science. No, we are thinking as the foundation for science because it was all predicated on a belief in, in God. Uh, those in the East, and we've been to some uh, amazing uh, uh, museums in China and some other places and, and their discoveries and abilities and things that they were, they were light years ahead of uh, us in the West. 
but their discoveries led to something practical, uh, something they needed, and then it ended right there. There was no sense of discovery because there was no belief in a creator God. Therefore, they didn't pursue laws that governed or principles that could be applied uh, to other uses. And they, in time, from the 1500s on, began to fall very much behind well, with the uh, scientific discovery. I want to read from uh, Kent Hughes, and, uh, and if you haven't gone to sleep yet, this is really going to do it. But uh, he's going to, uh, he's going to quote uh, Stephen Hawking's Kathy. Kathy told me the first service, make sure people that know that Dr. Stephen Hawking has nothing to do with Dr. David Hawking. And David always says, not related, spelled a different way, but uh, Stephen Hawking's considered uh, one of the most brilliant the theoretical physicists since Einstein, uh, talks about the, the vastness of the galaxy. And uh, so it's, it's like really big. So just kind of stay with me for uh, some of the numbers. There, there's a point to be made. Uh, I'm quoting Kent Hughes and his commentary that will quote, uh, he's quoting Steve Hawking's on a few occasions. In his best-selling A Brief History of Time, states that our galaxy is an average-sized spiral galaxy that looks to other galaxies like a swirl and a pastry roll, uh, and that is over 100,000 uh, 100, light years across, about 600 trillion miles. He says, we know that our galaxy is only one of some 100,000 million that can be seen using modern telescopes, each galaxy itself containing some 100,000 million stars. It is commonly held that the average distance between these 100,000 million galaxies is uh, each 600 trillion miles across and containing 100,000 million stars is 3 million light years. On top of that, the work of, the Edwin Hubble, uh, work of Edwin Hubble based on the Doppler effect has shown that the all red spectrum galaxies are moving away from us and that uh, nearly all are red. If you don't understand anything so far, you're okay, because here's the punchline now. The galaxy, it's like, it's like really big. How many stars? Lost me a long time ago. But uh, here's the punchline. Thus, the universe is constantly expanding. Some estimates say that the most distant galaxy is 8 billion light years away and racing away at 200 million miles an hour. Finally, the fact of the expanding universe demands a beginning though Hawking now doubts that the Big Bang was the beginning. Even the, even the most brilliant physicist on the planet today who is a complete atheist and very anti-Semitic, I might throw in as well, uh, says that the, because of the work of Edwin Hubble, think of the Hubble telescope, next time you're sharing with one of your friends, we know that the universe is expanding, therefore it had a beginning, but Hawkins doesn't know what to do with the beginner. <laughs> he struggles with that a little bit, being an atheist and believing that we live, you know, in a closed system. He's still shaking that bucket of sand, going, digging the lid off, going, come on, <laughs> make a castle here, you know. And uh, there's a lot of scientists that are working very hard to make the castle out of sand by shaking a bucket. And it's becoming very frustrating and very obvious to them that it's just not going to, uh, to happen. Now, in the past like back when I was in school, uh, the earth was still cooling and everything, but they had already found some fossils, uh, and they were, we were coming up with these transitional forms of man, you pilt uh, down man and all that stuff. Uh, and it just kind of turns out they're lying, you know, but, uh, you know, they haven't really gone back and redone those books and redone the little models in the museums and, uh, and so forth. And, I remember uh, we were on a trip to Denver and taking the kids to uh, a uh, huge uh, natural history museum in Denver. And you, you've seen, uh, it's kind of like the Knighton Museum. You probably know more about museums because of that movie. Than how many have seen A Night in the Museum? How many saw the second one? They're both <laughs> awesome. And uh, you probably know more about history from watching that, what a museum looks like. But, you know, you got the, you know, the cavemen and all that stuff. Most of those guys turned out, again, some guy finds a pig's tooth somewhere and goes, oh, that's unusual. I don't think that's a human tooth. Ooh, maybe this is the transition. If we had a tooth on the rest of the jaw, it would look like this. And if we had a jaw like this, then his head would look like this. If his head would look like this, his neck would look like this. If his head and neck looked like this, his body would look like this. If he was like this and he had a woman near him, she would look like this and the children would look like this and they would have a... I am not exaggerating. That's how they get it, from one pig's tooth. Uh, and this is what our, 
<laughs> our museums. So we would have fun with the kids and we'd laugh at all the museums. <laughs> no one told them yet that's not true. Oh, how funny, they haven't changed the exhibit. <laughs> and we would have a lot of fun. Comedy at the Natural History Museums. But, uh, and then we would see the dinosaurs that God created and so forth. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, it's very interesting, again, the days we're living in. And why is this an issue? Because Darwinian evolution completely undermines this opening verse. This opening verse, two verses, set the stage for the rest of the Bible. Now, Job says this. God says this to Job in Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens uh, uh, counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched out, uh, who stretched line upon line to what were its foundations fastened, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Quickly, uh, verse 2, the earth was uh, without form and void. And darkness is over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And again, the Hebrew without form and void is tohu wabohu. I just like saying it, so I just thought I would uh, throw that in. And it simply means something that is disordered uh, and, and empty. Jeremiah uses the same phrase in Jeremiah 4.23, where he says, I beheld the earth, and it was without form and void. Uh, and what does he say about it? And he's going to go on to talk about God's judgment. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man. All the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. All of its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. This is what God's going to do. But in the beginning, it was without form and void. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting. You get uh, some, some folks that try to insert a, a whole segment of theology between verses 1 and 2, sometimes called the gap theory. I took my best reading glasses. I held my Bible up as close as I could get it with my best reading glasses, and I didn't see a thing between verses 1 and 2. Uh, but somehow people see things between verses 1 and 2. And uh, usually it's because they're trying to somehow... Uh, take the information they have gained from scientists that are atheists and what they're saying about creation and bring some reconciliation with the text. So they want to take evolutionary thought and slide it in between verses 1 and 2. Uh, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but if you're interested about it, David Hawking and his uh, uh, commentary on the opening chapters, I think it's been re-released under the title In the Beginning, covers the first 12 chapters, and he does a wonderful job of spelling out that what we call the gap theory, all the beliefs uh, about it, where it comes from, what it's based on, and then debunks and diffuses based on scripture, based on the Hebrew language, why uh, it can't say what they're saying that it's saying. And uh, I'll let you uh, check that out for your, yourselves. But uh, Again, so, so very important. Two things that we want to take away is that creation must be accepted by faith. And uh, there's been more than one uh, person. I heard Ravi Zacharias uh, TV a couple of weeks ago say that um, God's given us enough evidence so that our faith is reasonable, but not so much evidence that it does not require faith. Uh, it's, it still does. But our position at least is reasonable to deny God's existence and to deny his creation is actually very unreasonable. It's, again, in a debate of people with the same skill sets, uh, uh, you just kind of feel bad for the atheist after a while because he's got nothing in terms of scientific or philosophical arguments. The second thing about the study is creation should cause us to worship. And Nehemiah 9.5 says, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. So we want to come away with our study to be worshipers of God, 
uh, to remember that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And just like Abraham, we're saved through faith. And uh, I think it'll be, uh, hope, I hope it'll be a, a great study for us. Well, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word and for this uh, foundational book that, uh, that tells us so much of your power and your attributes and your majesty, as well as your grace and your faithfulness to us. And uh, Lord, we just pray that we would grow in our knowledge of your word as we study it, and that would cause us to love you uh, and to worship you and to trust the promises that you make to us. Lord, so we just uh, ask your blessing as we continue to study in Jesus' name. Amen. When I go, don't cry for me. In my Father's arms I'll be. There was this world left on my soul. I'll be healed and I'll be whole. Sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus. Savior knows my name. Don't.